Anachrony is a game about time travel. So let's 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 model ourselves with time straight away and go back 88 miles per hour to last week's video where I've said this. We live in an age of board game opulence. Another game on Kickstarter that's made like 200 million dollars or when we are so spoiled for choice, why not choose games that have both? And this week we envisage the board game opulence come to fruition. Ladies and gentlemen, feast your eyes, or as we like to call them, the future cardboard appreciation receptacles, on the magnificence that is this game. It's huge. It's got big ideas. It's got big concepts. It's got big plastic miniatures. It has everything. And you're saying to me right now, but Efka, wait a minute. Didn't, how, did, how did you know last week that you were going to review a game that's really like opulent with excellent gameplay. Who said it has excellent gameplay? This could be a role of move forward. Yeah. For all and that's what makes an, an extraordinary game that should be on every board game connoisseur's bookshelf. If you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to click the like and subscribe. All right, okay, well, that was anticlimactic. What the hell do I do now? What I do is, I tell you about Anachrony. What is an Anachrony? Is it a type of custard? Is it related to Chloe Seventy? Only in as much that they're both displaced in time. Anachrony is big. It is trying to juggle multitudes of concepts and ideas. Too much, perhaps, for any board game to handle properly. And it almost succeeds at it. But it comes so close that it's not only admirable, it is commendable. Anachrony is set in a dystopian and desolate future, much like an English allotment, except everything is a bit bleak and purple for some reason. An unknown disaster has struck Earth and humanity would have been wiped out, but thanks to the invention of time travel, they have suits instead and can now harvest resources. No, not those kinds of suits exosuits. Sadly, because of time travel, we know that another disaster is imminent and there is nothing we can do but prepare. Because in a plot twist no one saw coming, the best prepared country will get the most immigrants and will win. Because it's friggin' logical, come on. Unless you have a dedicated workforce, you're going to work alone and die alone. I love this theme. I mean, I know that it's like, it, it's not all, uh, it's like someone took the cheesiest episode of The Twilight Zone and actually made it into a board game. And a lot of it is due thanks to these wonderful miniatures because they are just out of this world. And I know they're not like as intricately detailed as, you know, cool mini or not stuff, but they are inspired. It's like they took H.R. Geiger and the people that worked on the set of Forbidden Planet and locked them into a room overnight and made them sculpt minis. Just look at this dude with the faces on all sides. How cool is that? Big props to Laszlo Forgatch, who's the 3D sculptor for this game. I'm sorry, Laszlo, if I got your name wrong, but there's an argument to be made and that might be an entirely valid argument that these don't need to be so lavish because the entire function that they fulfill in the game is they they slot in one of your workers just like that. I mean, it feels incredibly satisfying, by the way. And that's kind of it. That's the entire function they fulfill. You see, Anachrony is a worker placement game, meaning a game where you have a set number of workers and then you send them to different action slots and then when they're there, they get to do a thing like uh, build a building or hire some more workers or achieve breakthroughs or get some water or gather some other resources or trade one resource into another resource. And once you've stepped onto that particular action slot, no other player can go on that action slot for the rest of the round until things finally reset. These days, I often feel like worker placement games need to do something unique within that genre of itself to stand out. They need to be innovative, and Anachrony does that in spades. There are four types of workers in Anachrony. You have engineers, you have scientists, you have friggin' bureaucrats, because in this future world, they're not, they're not the hero that we want, but they are the hero that we need. And finally, finally, you have geniuses in the stroke of genius in Anachrony. Artistically, all the geniuses are depicted as women. And I think that's genius. <laughs> 
but where you send what type of worker matters. So for example, administrators are much better at actually hiring other people. You can only make science with scientists. Engineers will give you a discount on whatever building you're purchasing because they're good at like MacGyvering things together. And finally, certain types of workers get refreshed whenever you send them to a certain type of spot. So for example, if you send an engineer to gather resources, he won't come back home tired. At which point you should be asking yourself, wait a minute, why, why do the workers get tired? Welcome to your personal player board in Anachrony. Right here you have your powered up exosuits, you have your ready workers that are willing to work, you have some resources, you have some water, and this is where your workers go when they come back from their job because they're tired and lazy. They just don't want to do anything anymore until you actually spend water to refresh them. Now, water is an abstraction, meaning that, you know, that's just a code term for sustenance. Unless, of course, in this futuristic world, people have developed some sort of cybernetic stomachs that only require water and maybe earwax or something. Anyway, anyway. To actually get these guys back to work, you need to feed them water. And to do so, you need to actually do an action. Meaning, whilst you're busy feeding your workers from a van with TV dinners, other nations are developing things like teleportation devices or Legolands or something else that's very, very useful. But, but, each time you do so, you also have to spend a requisite amount of water. It's just a nuisance. However, you always have a choice of not feeding your workers and then sending them to work anyway, which would be okay, but of course, you're not doing a nice thing, you're not being a nice person, you're not being a good leader, you're just, you know, being a despot, really. And because of that, each time you do so, and it, that doesn't cost you an action at all, you move down this track, which means at the end of the game, you'll have negative victory points. Whereas if you do feed your workers and you're a nice person, then you move up this track. And that signifies that you're good and you'll get good victory points. But that's not even the funkiest bit about worker placement in this game. And that's where we go back to these plastic miniatures. There are exactly two different types of worker placement slots in this game. The ones on your personal player board where you've built buildings throughout the course of the game and now those buildings give you actions that are unique and exclusive to you and let you do different things to other players and don't require an exosuit for a worker to be sent there. And then the ones on the main player board which require you to wear an exosuit to go to because it's not a particularly nice place and you need some protection. And why are these exosuits like giant beasts with wings well because the military department for this particular faction is particularly artsy and they have a form of self-expression and I for one am okay with that all right don't judge and you might say that this is this is just overproduced it's too much it's too much of everything and these are too big and there's no reason for them they shouldn't exist this is just Another example of a Kickstarter game where they needed to have big minis and lots of stuff so they put it in because how else would you succeed on Kickstarter? And if you say that, you, you're right. But here's one thing, I don't care because these are wonderful. They are such an excellent way of representing the game's theme and engaging with the components in a tactile way. It introduces the game to people who wouldn't necessarily normally try to begin to play that sort of game because of how huge and how inaccessible it seems at first. And it, this kind of, for some people, might countermand that. And I can only see that as a benefit. Except you don't get these when you buy the game. Unless, of course, you back it on Kickstarter, which in which case you already have the game and you don't care. But if you were to go out and buy the game in the shop, you wouldn't get these, you would get these instead, and you just put your work on top of that, which might be fine with you, but I don't know, I just like these so much. I wish that I wish that you could get them, and you can actually, you can buy them directly from the publisher's website, and if you live in the States or Europe, you do have some very reasonable shipping costs to where you live, but they're only there until stocks last, and when they go away, they go away, and this is the pettiest and most unreasonable criticism I have. It's not even a criticism, because I understand what it's like for a small publisher to do something that's overproduced and then, then try to sustain it. It's probably impossible, and... I get why things are the way 
they are. I just think that these miniatures, so for some people, might be the thing that kind of gets them to, to buy into it. And I wish they were more readily available. But there's a potentially troubling gameplay aspect, regardless of whether they're cardboard hexes or plastic miniatures. You don't just get as many exosuits as you like, you have to power them up at the start of the round, and each one you power up costs a power core. The first three each round you get for free, but the fourth, the fifth, and the sixth one cost a power core. To make matters more complicated, each one you don't power up awards you additional water. And the trouble with that is that you have to make this decision before you actually execute the round. And you kind of have to start formulating a plan before you've even done anything. And of course, because it's a worker placement game, actions that you want to do might be denied to you. Well, you often just kind of have to eyeball it and see if it sticks. And if you overpay, you're paying too many resources. And if you underpay, you don't get to do as many things as you would like to do. It's kind of like managing a family with six children on a tight budget because you work at the milk carton factory and then you ha you don't have that much money. Which of the six children you're going to feed? Ugh. That analogy has gone really wrong. But you kind of see what I mean, don't you? Is there too many rules? I feel like there's too many rules, but don't forget, we did say this game is full of big ideas and the rabbit hole of rules is far from over. It's kind of like a Kinder Egg that you open and instead of a toy, you open a toy inside as well and there's another Kinder Egg inside of it and then you open the toy inside that Kinder Egg and there's another Kinder Egg and when you open that one, there's a rabbit inside and he says, there's many more rules inside. You get the idea. Time travel, there's time travel in this game. Oh my God, how do I even explain this? Maybe I can just... Dear future Efka, please send a finished review of Anachrony. Yours truly, past Efka. Right. Should be uh, any moment now. Yes, and we will, when we look at Rune Wars, the mean Rune Wars, the mean Rune Wars, that's uh, uh, something went wrong. I better do these myself. Time travel needs to be exciting in any game, and it's exciting here because in Anachrony, time travel is represented by these cardboard tiles and, and these cardboard bits. And it is exciting because it punishes you for being greedy. What happens is that at the start of every round, you can ask for anything from your future self, like you want an engineer, here you go, or here's a gold or whatever, or you can ask for a Christmas tree, but actually there's no rules in this game for a Christmas tree, so you're not gonna get one. But as soon as you do, you get it. But the trick is you have to first secretly select zero, one, or two of these tiles and when you do you put them in a fist and together with the other players you open them. The reason that moment is filled with tension is because you don't know how many resources your opponents are requesting at the same time and you don't want to request more than they did because if you do see all of the things that you requested go onto this time travel track for later tracking because then at the start of every other round each tile is going to be checked and look for whoever is the player who requested more than others. And if they are that person, and if you are that person, you have to roll the Paradox die. Paradox die will give you Paradox tokens. Paradox tokens, once you collect enough, will turn into anomalies. Anomalies are just bad because they're negative victory points. So it creates a mechanic in a game that's all a big meaty Euro with you know strategies and the bigger brain solemnly wins that says, ah, no, because you have to kind of hedge your bets and not be too greedy. And time travel is all about greediness, isn't it? Because if you watch 12 Monkeys and you try to get too much, then you just find out that time keeps looping onto each other and you can't escape your fate like Oedipus the King, which is even weirder because then he has sex with his mother. It's not great. It's just don't. Well, do read it, because it's pretty good. Anachrony is filled with these decisions that you have to make sometimes before the game even starts, or often before you know what you're doing. And that might be a problem for you, but I actually quite like it. There are these leaders, and you have to select one of them when the game starts, and they're pretty much going, not only going to give you a special ability, but drive you in a particular direction, creating a symmetry between the factions that you've chosen. Now, you don't... You don't even, you don't eat, sometimes you don't even know what's good in this game because it's voluptuous. It's pretty, pretty big. And estimating 
the mechanisms and how they interact with each other and what's going to be a good strategy and a bad strategy is not impossible in your first playthrough. And to be honest, I've played this quite a few times now and I still don't really know myself. Here's the thing. It's fine. Yes, you do have to make decisions that make you feel uncomfortable, but that's time travel for you, right? It's it's punishing and and you don't know what's going to happen in the future. This is ironically thematic. And of course, because you don't want to get these paradoxes and you don't want these anomalies to happen, you're kind of obligated in the future in the game to send the resources back to your past self, except of course you're not going to get them because you already got them. I know it's confusing, but that mechanism onto itself is a puzzle that you have to figure out as well. And <laughs> you end up with something that is zero sum because you've sent something back to yourself from the future and then you're sending it back to yourself from the future, effectively getting nothing. So why do it? Well, this is where we arrive at the game's main incentivization mechanism. And I'm actually going to let future Mr. Forsyth handle that for me. And what a pounds make! God, no, Bruce, points make prizes. Is everything in the future just so screwed up? Anyway, points. There's a board game of jargon, point salad, which basically means that a board game manufactures maniacally points for everything in the game as a main incentivization mechanism. And Anachrony is no exception to that. You get points for building buildings, you get points for feeding your workers, you get points for fulfilling loans from the future, you get points for evacuating people from the capital when the game is collapsing, because the game actually does collapse at some point. Not mechanically, thematically, there's a collapse. I'll get to that in just one bit. And there's a lot of it, but actually I quite like it. Whilst some elements of the points thing feel superfluous, like for example, you get points for having a majority of something at the end of the game. And if you have more neutronium than the other person, then you get an extra three points, which seems measly in the grand scheme of things. On top of that, there's a variant that says, hey, you can also draft these end game scoring conditions, which is just too much. But regardless of that, what Anachrony does do well is it manages to obfuscate just how well your opponents are doing. So you're never kind of focused on denying them points or grabbing things away from them. You are building your own future. This, that, that works for me. And so the story goes, there's 500 different mechanisms in this game. Did I mention that at some point through the course of this game, there's an event hap that happens that changes completely the way the game plays and adds a bunch of new rules. And it's, it's just a lot of that. And some of the concepts are easy to understand and some of them are not. And there's about three different modules you can latch onto in the base game. And if you buy the expansion with the miniatures, you get two extra modules. And some of them are, n I'm not really even sure why they're there. And some of them actually do make the game a bit, little bit more interesting. There's just a lot. There's a lot. And I, look, here's the rub. It all coalesces into something. It all makes sense. And I understand from the designer's perspective, who probably wanted to include absolutely everything in this game. I understand the reasoning behind all of it because it does add up and it does make for an engaging game experience. The only problem is that I just I don't think it doesn't still need to be there. And I just wish that Anachrony had a good editor that took a pair of scissors and just trimmed that hedge before we end up with this. God. How did they get it so smooth? But, 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 all these bits, everything here, this board, this plastic miniatures, these tokens and chits and whatever, that is all right. But the best bit of the game happens right here, right in this tiny little bit, because that's where the buildings are. And there's a lot of them, there's a whole huge stack. And every time you play, a different array is going to come out and you never know how they're going to develop. And the best part is that those buildings create an engine building element on your player board that is exclusive and unique to you. And no one else can do what you can do. And because the factions are asymmetrical and the boards, they have two different sides, A and B. And every time you play, you might have a different experience with the same faction, different strategies, different leaders, different paths you can go on. Every gameplay will feel unique and you'll get to do cool things. And, you know, you get yourselves buildings that make you a lot of water and then you get to convert that water into something else. And because the game has so many intricate mechanisms, 
you feel like you are navigating them and you're beating them and you're being smart. And that's why I really, really like Anachrony because it makes you feel really smart. For some reason, I feel like I should apologize for liking Anachrony because I know that so many people won't get past behind this ginormous rule set and won't get to appreciate everything that this game has to offer. And that's fine. Every game doesn't have to be for everyone. And I know I've said this countless of times. I really, really like that Anachrony is not just one of those really dry Euro games with really meaty, complex systems. There is an undeniable feeling that the theme is married to this game in so many different ways. Like, you want to get rid of Anomaly, sure, okay, you have to pay some resources and whatever and then you can get rid of it, but you also have to kill a worker, like actually kill them, meaning they go into the Anomaly and they, it's like, sorry, what are we talking about? What worker? I don't think, I don't think the worker we were talking about ever existed. See, see, that's what I'm talking about. It doesn't matter to me that it's vast, ginormous and overproduced because behind all of that, there's a good game and that's what I care about. Except that we feel it's a little unbalanced. Maybe, who knows? I mean, we haven't played this game enough to really be able to properly tell. But if you've come to this channel for that, you've, you've come to the wrong place. But is this something about unfairness of objectives that each faction gets and some feel harder and some easier? And sometimes you're just in a playthrough that feels like you're doing nothing at all. So there is that. I did kind of have to say that because it feels fair that I have to say that. But but otherwise, we really like the game. Oh boy, if you enjoyed this video, then... Wait, wait, no, stop, stop, stop the music, stop the music. That's not how this video ended. We saw the ending before that. It means we're not bound to our fate. We can do what we like. We're free. The future is ours. What should we do with this newfound future? I think we should really, just as a favor to me and no pun included for letting you discover that, you should, you should click the like and the subscribe button. And as a reward, you'll not just get points, you'll also get more funny videos. So you should, you should check us out and, and do the thing, do the thing for me right now. Future is waiting. Also notice how there's so many components that you didn't, you didn't even spot the Yoshi, did you? Look, look at him right there, it's just hanging out in his Mario Kart. Uh, there's too many bits in this game.